Thank you, my friends, for this pulpit. It, uh, from the bottom of my heart and the height of my head, I thank you for this. We begin a new sermon series today. We're going to spend the summer with David and God. And uh, I don't even know, because there's so many places the Lord could take us on this, but I do know he will take us places. I'd like you to be praying because there's a lot to choose from. And I believe your prayers for God to help in the choosing of what to preach and what we need, he answers those prayers. So we get to meet one of my favorite Bible characters, um, the man after God's own heart. But to begin with, I'll just say that's because he was the boy after God's own heart. This sermon is entitled, When No One Was Looking. Our Father God, I dedicate this summer series to you. You are so powerful, you are able to speak even to us feeble mortals with weak minds and inadequate vocabularies. I ask that through the life of David, through your words, through your words and his, that you will take us anywhere you want, that you will show us things, that you will say things, but more than that, that you would speak with creative power into us to change us, that we would be more like you. I pray this, Jesus, in your powerful name. Amen. In those days, it was a garage door and a tennis ball and me. As a kid, I was there day after day out in our driveway in front of our two-car garage, that big wooden doors back then, big giant garage door, throwing and catching, throwing and catching. The driveway was on a slant, which made it interesting. There was a four-inch horizontal slat of wood across the entire middle from one side to the other, and then right in the middle of that two-car garage, another four-inch slat of wood right down, making the centerpiece very small. And there I'd be day after day, day after day, playing important, vital games with myself. It was usually the seventh game of the World Series, bottom of the ninth inning, bases loaded and two outs. No spring training games for me, no recess stuff. It was big time, and the pressure was on. A walk would tie, a strikeout we'd win, two walks we'd lose, it was as simple as that. Hero or goat, nothing in between everything on the line. Young Ronnie, that was me, back in those days, had been called in from the bullpen. When I reached the mound, the coach handed me the tennis ball and said, go get him. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? Best batter in the league, best batter on their team, 355 average and hit with power, leading the majors in home runs. The look he gave me as he stepped to the plate told me he didn't take me serious. He couldn't believe the opposition had sent me out to face him, to pitch to him with bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning at the seventh game of the World Series. Why, it was ludicrous. It was an insult. But with one swing, he would win the World Series, be the MVP, and the only thing left of me would be an asterisk by my name in Cooperstown as the guy who lost the World Series and gave up the winning run and blew it for his team. The first pitch I threw, missed that little four-inch spot, ball one. Second pitch, right in there for a strike, all even, one and one. Mighty Casey looked a little surprised. Third pitch on its way, just low, two and one. The tension in the stadium was palpable. Vin Scully, this is, I was a kid in Southern Cal. Vin Scully was the Dodger famous MLB announcer, and he just retired a couple of years ago, 90 some years old, so was still doing baseball commentary. He was having trouble finding any facts out about me. The kid out of nowhere, suddenly on the biggest stage with everything on the line. I wound up and I fired the fourth pitch, ball three. Three and one, the crowd groaned. Now there's no room for error. 
That four inch slat strike zone looked mighty small from where I stood in the driveway. I went into my wind up and I nailed it. The crowd was on its feet now, finally. Three and two, this was it. Mighty Casey knew what I'd be throwing and he smiled because he was a fastball hitter. Standing at the plate against the young kid a rookie just called up, he knew he was about to add yet another victory to his illustrious career. He was going to take this out of the park. I wiped the sweat from my brow on the back of my little hand. I looked at my catcher. I looked at his signal. I shook him off. I shook him off a second time and then the nod. This was it. I gripped that fuzzy tennis ball by two seams. The wind up, the delivery, I let loose with everything I had. It was a dagger right down the heart of the plate. Power against power, a swing and a miss, strike three, nailed that four inch slat. The crowd was going wild, boom of fireworks above us, color flashed in the sky of the stadium, teammates rushed the mound. The bullpen guys came racing in, what a celebration, what an unbelievable win. In the locker room they were spraying Martinelli's non-alcoholic grape juice at each other. Victory, victory, victory. Of course, it was only a garage door a tennis ball, and I was just a kid. But day in and day out, day after day, month after month, year after year, I was out there throwing and catching. When we'd be on summer breaks, I'd be out in the woods or in the fields. I'd find a big stick, stones, throw them up, hit the stone, hit the stone eye-hand coordination, lots of practice, when no one was watching. So when the lights went on, the umps were there, and the opposition was there, I was ready. We enter a new series, spending time with one of my Bible heroes, a kid who rocked the world, rocked a giant, the mighty Casey of the Old Testament went down. 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 40. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. <clears throat> Verse 39. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from a brook, put them in the shepherd's bag in the pouch, which he had. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. He had to take Saul's armor off. He picks up a staff and he picks up a sling now this was familiar. This is how it had been, day after day, day in and day out, month after month, year after year. Not the giant, but everything else, the staff and the field, the five smooth stones in his hand. Uh, he knew this, he knew it by heart. I mean, talk about a tough contest. It's the bottom of the 40th day inning when the kid is called in from the bullpen or the sheep pen in this case. But this, this was familiar. He felt the stones in his hand. How many times had he been in this setting? Out in the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere with his father's flock, his staff and his sling. As far back as he can remember, it has always been like this. He has been preparing for such a time as this day after day, month after month, year after year. He'd done this so often that it had become second nature to him. When he practiced, he set up the scenario, lions approaching, bears approaching, Philistines approaching, nail that tree, nail that boulder, hit that spot, practicing. Swing with the staff, swing with the sling, but there's a lot more to the story than that. He'd been practicing a whole lot more than that. More than with just a staff or a sling. 
He'd been living a life of prayer and praise day after day, month after month, year after year. He'd been writing songs to God since he was barely old enough to walk. He'd been worshiping the Most High God even when no one was looking. Hour after hour, day after day, he filled those fields around Bethlehem with songs of and for the Most High God. He was practicing a lot more than how to be better than a ninja with a staff or better aim with a sling than Robin Hood with a bow. From his childhood, he was close to God. He hadn't just been out walking with the sheep. He'd been out walking with God. He, he hadn't just been leading sheep. He'd been practicing following God's lead step by step all the way to this brook, to this hillside, to this moment. He'd been living his life practicing faith. He'd been practicing faith when no one was looking. He'd been learning how to surrender more and more fully to the will of God. You see, he's not just any young shepherd. He is a praying young shepherd. He's a young person of and in the word of God. His songs glorify God, and his life is a God-honoring, real worship life. See, for David... From the time he was little, it was about a relationship, and it was real. And even you and I know when it's real. The prayer life of David. You just look at the Psalms. How many are his? His prayer life and praise life were real. He wasn't just mumbling through the songs. I mean, not only did David have a heart, he had a heart after God. And that's what God said about him. He's a man after my own heart. Wouldn't you like for God to be able to say that about you? You know, you and I can live so closely to God that he can do that. For the time David was young, he and God were close. And he didn't just give God honor, he loved him. That's that whole heart thing. In this series, you'll see, if you don't already know it, that David loved God. He, he didn't serve him out of fear or just because it was the right thing to do. He loved him. It was a love relationship for David. Is it that for you? That day in 1 Samuel chapter 17 on the hillside with that giant, David was many things, but what he was in a word, he was ready. And ready is a beautiful word. All those years, pretend that's a bear after the flock. Pretend that's a lion out to kill my father's lambs. And then the day came, and it wasn't pretend. A real lion took a lamb, and he didn't say, hey, where's the manual on lamb protection? It was reflex. Defend the sheep, save the lambs. In an instant, he was all over that lion. He wasn't weighing the pros and cons of taking on a lion. He never would have done it. If there'd been a committee, been lamb chops. He's just on that lion in a blink. Like lightning, he struck him. The lamb was delivered from the lion's mouth. And when the lion rose up, he grabbed it by a mane. This guy's crazy. And hit him again. And hit him again. And the lion was dead. When no one was watching. There was that day when it wasn't pretend. It was a real bear. But he had placed himself in this position so many times practicing for this day that he was on automatic. He didn't even have to think about it. In an instant, his position, placing himself between the father's flock and a bear. And that's what he is going to do on a hillside someday. Put himself between his father's flock and a bear of a man 
and a lion of a warrior. And he struck and killed that bear when no one was looking. David shepherd's staff, sling and stone. Bears drop, lions drop, lambs slayed, saved, and flocks spared. And it wasn't just because David was a good shepherd boy. It was a lot more than that. It was because he was God's shepherd boy. All those times with the staff and the sling, all those days of care and practice, prayer and surrender, he was a lot of things the day he faced Goliath. But what he was in a word was ready. So in 1 Samuel 17, when you see him bending over a brook, choosing his stones carefully, standing with God and for God and his people, this was his life. He'd been doing this with God day after day, month after month, year after year. Goliath didn't know it. But out there in the wilderness, with his staff and his sling and his father's flock in danger, David had the home field advantage. And Goliath, the lion's coming down. And Goliath, the bear's going to go down. As they approach each other, the Finn Scullies of Israel and the Philistines are trying hard to find some facts about David. The color commentators don't know much, but God knew plenty. He shares some about him in chapter 16, beginning with verse 1 through 3, before he ever got there. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? All right, prophet. Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have proved myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? I like this. I actually like when God shows some of this side, you know. I mean, you can be a little concerned even as a prophet. <laughs> how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. When leaders forget their calling, all they care about is their power. And innocent people die. And we are seeing it in the news every day. But all of those wicked leaders, they will all find their end. How can I go? He'll kill me. Lord said, take a heifer with you. Say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you, you get, watch, look at this. I will show you what, I, what you will do. I will show you what I will do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7. And so it was when they came, they looked at Eliab. He said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his outward appearance, his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? And that is still true. Then the lineup passes by him and seven, big family. Samuel says to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Verse 11 and 12, Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? He said, there remains yet the youngest. There he is keeping the sheep. I'll say this. The best leaders of God's people have always been shepherds. David and Moses. 
And Samuel said to Jesse, send, bring him, for we will not have potluck till he comes. <laughs> the clear word. <laughs> he was ruddy with bright eyes, good looking. The Lord said, arise, anoint him, for he is the one. But it wasn't because he was good looking or ruddy because Eliab didn't make it. It's because this kid had a God heart. A heart after God. And God knows those things. And those things matter from your first days of life. That day on the hillside facing Goliath, David was a lot of things. But out of all the things that David was, the beauty of it is he was ready. He wasn't alone. He was with God. And more than that, God was with him. Day after day, year after year. In the little everyday things of life, David had been allowing God to mold him day in and day out with God making choices to be faithful, walking with God while tending sheep, writing songs for God, making music for God. And God, this is the beauty, was writing the song of the psalmist's life. David, the boy with the sheep, David, the boy with the staff and sling, the boy who could sing and play a harp, the boy that lived life with and for God. During all those days, months, and years, David wasn't just growing up, he was growing up in God. Are you living your days like that? David wasn't just some young person with talents. Those talents were all about and for God, and as meager as they were, David placed all those talents in God's hands, and God can always do great things, even with little common stuff, if you put it in his hands. And question on my heart today, am I living like that? Are you living like that? See, Goliath didn't know it. He would have made me look small. But David had the home field advantage. And it wasn't because the crowd was behind him. The people behind him didn't believe. No, David had the home field advantage because the shepherd was standing out there in the middle of nowhere with his shepherd's staff in one hand and a sling in the other. He's on a field, on a hillside, standing with and for God, protecting his father's flock, standing between the flock and the threat. And kids, one little stone went in the sling. And the sling went round and round. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And round and round and round and round. And round and round and round. And one little stone went up in the air. And the giant came tumbling down. It had been a long walk from the sheep pen to the pitcher's mound, 1 Samuel 17. But David had lived in for and followed God day in and day out, year after year. He had followed God step by step all the way to this brook, to this hillside. So David was many things that day, but mostly he was ready. And ready is a beautiful thing. So let's live, leave here, walking with him day after day, month after month, because there are still giants in the land. Well, Father God, it was more than just a story. It's a story of you with one of your kids. What story do you want to write in the lives of everyone here? May they open their heart for you to write the story. May they have the faith to walk it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.